Hello and uh, welcome one and all. Today we will continue with the AWS series. In the previous video, we created a data lake using the data saved in S3 bucket with AWS Glue. We defined a crawler that inferred schema from S3 and created an AWS Glue catalog. It generated the following tables and we can query these tables using AWS Athena. Today we will build on this. We will create a Redshift cluster so we can move this data into the database for further analysis. Redshift is based on Postgres. So if you are familiar with Postgres, then some of the functionality is similar. In order to connect to Redshift via AWS Glue or from your local SQL client, for example, dBeaver, we will need to configure additional resources in AWS. First component we need is the IAM role. In the previous session, we created this IAM role, AWS Glue Service role, dash AdventureWorks. Initially, this role had S3 and Glue Service permissions. I went ahead and added the Redshift access. We can create a new role if need be. Under IAM role, we can click on the role and click on Create Role button on the right. We can leave it default as AWS Service and we need to select a use case. We can select the Redshift service, but our main use case is Glue. We need to check the option Allow Glue to call AWS services on your behalf. On the next page, we can search for permission policies, for example, S3, and select it. Then we'll look for Glue and select the service. And finally, Redshift. Next, we give this role a name, S3 to Redshift role review the permissions attached to it, and we click the Create button to create this role. Role is created. We can use this role or the first one, AdventureWorks. They both have the same permissions. This was the first component. Next piece of the puzzle is VPC or Virtual Private Cloud Setting. We haven't yet explored this. By default, AWS provides us with a default VPC instance when we create an account. If we need to, we can go ahead and create another VPC, but I will stick with default VPC. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC, is a service that lets us launch AWS resources in a logically isolated virtual network that we define. Each VPC creates an isolated virtual network environment in AWS Cloud, dedicated to your AWS account. Other AWS resources and services operate inside of VPC networks to provide cloud services. Amazon creates one default VPC for each account with following resources. Subnets, routing table, security groups, network access control list. The default VPC comes with six subnets. A subnet or subnetwork is a network inside a network. A subnet is a range of IP addresses in your VPC. You can launch AWS resources in a specified subnet. We can use a public subnet for resources that must be connected to internet and a private subnet for resources that won't be connected to internet. Traffic within the subnets are routed through route tables. Our VPC comes with a main routing table. It determines how network traffic is directed inside your VPC and subnets. The main route table is automatically associated with all VPC subnets. Here we have two options. We can update the main route table to direct network traffic or create our own route table to be used for individual subnet traffic. The VPC is missing one component. We need to create one resource to enable connection to Redshift and this is an endpoint. Glue needs an endpoint attached to this VPC in order to connect to the resources in it. For example, our Redshift cluster that we will create next. So what's an endpoint? Let's say our Redshift instance is in a private subnet. This removes all connectivity from Redshift instance to the internet or AWS services. We will need AWS Glue to connect to this service to perform ETL. This is where the VPC endpoints comes into picture. It makes sure that the traffic between your VPC and the particular AWS service is open via VPC endpoint. 
and it does not leave the AWS network. Let's go ahead and create an endpoint. We will give this endpoint a sensible name and let's look for S3 and we will select the type gateway. Next, we will select the VPC. In this case, we only have one and then we select the main route table. Here, we only have one default route table. This will route the traffic in the underlying subnet. We are going to leave the full access checked. This allows access to any resources within the VPC. In a production environment, you would limit the access to appropriate resources. Okay, let's go ahead and create the endpoint. The endpoint is in place and it is attached to our VPC. And here is the endpoint ID. Let's make note of this. This should automatically be attached to our main route table. If you were to go inside the routes and route tables, and let's edit the routes. And our endpoint is associated right here. It is the first entry. We can compare it with the endpoint to double check it. While we are in the VPC section, let's explore the security group. A security group acts as a virtual firewall, controlling the traffic that is allowed to reach and leave the resources that are associated with it. For example, after you associate a security group with a Redshift instance, it controls the inbound and outbound traffic for the instance. By default, we have a security group and this security group has one inbound rule. Let's click on edit rules. This has a self-referencing rule already in place. This rule is referencing the ID of the security group. We are going to add a couple of more rules. The first will be for Redshift and we will set this to my IP. This will help us connect to Redshift from our local machine using dBeaver or Jupyter Notebook. We need another rule for Redshift. This will be for IPv4 addresses in this VPC. We have added two additional rules. First to connect locally to Redshift and second one opens the Redshift to any IPv4 addresses. However, the self-referencing rule restricts the source to the same security group in this VPC so it is not open to all networks. Okay, we are done with the networking piece. Let's go ahead and create the Redshift cluster. We can search for Redshift service. This will launch the service and we will click on create cluster to create a new cluster. Usually I go with the free trial and it is good to go with the free version if this is the first time you're diving into AWS. However, it does not let us customize the settings. So I will choose production and I'll try to keep the settings that match the free trial so we don't incur any additional charges. I'll leave the user to default and provide a password. I will associate a role to this cluster. We only have one role, so I'll go ahead and select the default. We will inspect the role and it has following permissions attached to it. Let's go ahead and associate this role. Next, we will overwrite some default settings. This is important if you plan to connect to Redshift from your local PC. So under network and security, we will check if the appropriate VPC is selected. So it'll be the default VPC and we have the default security group associated with it. Here is the important bit. We need to make it publicly accessible. This allows the devices outside the VPC to connect to database through the endpoint. Let's click the create button to create this cluster. It will take a while to create all the resources. So I will wait for it to complete and come back. Okay, the cluster is available. We can click on it to explore the properties. Under properties, we'll find most of the information needed to connect to this Redshift instance. We have the database name, port, and the username. And the password will be whatever you supplied when we created the cluster. Make sure the publicly accessible option is enabled. Let's scroll up and copy the endpoint for this cluster. This is the host name in the connection string. I'll bring up dBeaver and let's go ahead and create a new connection. Let's search for Redshift and select it. I'll go ahead and paste the endpoint in the host. It has few additional pieces such as database and the port. So I will remove these along with the colon and I will supply the password. Rest of the details are fine. Let's go ahead and test it and it is a success. I will click finish to save this connection. We have successfully connected to Redshift using dBeaver. We can expand and preview the database. At the moment, we don't have any tables. Let's go ahead and create a new table. I'll open a new query window and paste in a create table script. Let's execute the query and refresh the table node. 
we have a new table in the database. We can go back and confirm this in the AWS. I'll launch the query editor and we will need to connect to the database first. So let's go ahead and select the cluster. Okay, we are in the dev database and in the public schema. And our table is present here. We can query it, but it doesn't have any data yet. I think this is a good stopping point and we will carry on from here in the next session. Like, share and subscribe. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.